Hello, my name is Athena Ramos and I'm an assistant professor at UNMC. I'm in the College of Public Health. I work in the Center for Reducing Health Disparities, which is part of the Department of Health Promotion. I'm also associated with the Central State Center for Agricultural Safety and Health, which serves a seven state region consisting of North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and Minnesota. And finally, I'm also associated with OYES, the Office of Latino Latin American Studies here at UNO. So I'm excited to be with you today here on Quarantining with OYES. Today I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about health and what it is, talking a little bit about vulnerable workers, which is my primary research interest, vulnerable workers in the agri-food system, and then talk a little bit about COVID-19 and the current crisis that we have going on now. So first, to start out with, um, what is health? When we think about health, I think oftentimes we think about, uh, well, my back hurts or I have a fever, um, you know, those sorts of things. We don't often think about health in terms of our mental health uh, or in terms of our social well-being. But according to the World Health Organization, health is a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Health is a human right. It's in, in a lot of international human rights documents. Um, for example, if we look at the Constitution of the World Health Organization, they say that everybody uh, has the right to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health, which is one of the fundamental rights of every human being. But we can find this sort of language throughout many uh, international human rights documents. Um, we know um, that work is a social determinant of health, although oftentimes when we hear about social determinants of health, we hear a lot of talk around race, ethnicity, immigration status, starting to hear more about that. Um, but work also is a social determinant of health because it can positively and negatively affect uh, a person's health. And work can influence things that put people into social hierarchies, which give them access or don't give them access um, to certain uh, benefits or social protections. We know that work can overlap with a lot of other concepts like socioeconomic status, like gender, like age, uh, and immigration legal status. So work is a socially determinant of health. Let me give you just an example of how that plays out. Um, there's over almost three million people, workers, who die each year due to work-related uh, injuries or work-related illnesses. Um, and there's about 374 million workers who suffer from a, a non-fatal work-related injury. So if we looked at that in terms of numbers per day, that's 7,500 people each day who die from a work-related cause and so many more who are suffering from work-related injuries. These things have an impact on people's health, not just uh, at the work environment, but their health across, uh, across all spectrums, whether that be at work, but also at home. Uh, we know that there's a difference um, in life expectancy across demographic groups that is explained partly by the different job conditions which people experience. In fact, they estimate that that's 10 to 40% to of the difference in terms of life expectancy. So what I'm saying here is that work has a huge impact on our well-being and that people, depending on the types of jobs that they do, may be literally dying for a paycheck. There is also in the human rights uh, documents, uh, the concept of decent work. And this idea of decent work is something that is outlined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in, in Articles 23, 24, and 25, which say that everyone has the right to work, um, free choice of employment, um, 
and the ability to have just and favorable conditions to work and protections against unemployment, that everyone has the right to rest and leisure and reasonable limitations on working hours. And everyone has the right to a standard of living that's adequate for themselves and for their families. So this idea of decent work as being something that gives you enough uh, money so that you're able to live a decent quality of life and that you have a relatively um, decent work that is um, favorable conditions in the workplace, that you have some sort of protections. These are ideas that are should be universal and across the globe, and unfortunately, uh, they're not that universal, not uh, across the globe and not here in the U.S. either. There are also labor rights that are in uh, international treaties and documents such as um, the Occupational Safety and Health Convention, um, which says that um, countries have a duty uh, to ensure the occupational safety and health of their workers and that both employers and countries have to work together to uh, promote safety and health and to actually take action to improve working conditions. Uh, we know that there are practices that are harmful to, to people's health, harmful work practices. For example, thinking around economic insecurity and layoffs and job losses and unpredictable schedules, those really do have a negative impact on people's uh, health and well-being. The idea of having long hours or having to experience workplace bullying and abuse, discrimination, harassment, uh, and a lack of, of social support, whether that be from colleagues or from supervisors, those are things that are harmful to people's health. And of course, Last but not least, and I want to emphasize this one, is that the lack of health and safety protections is a harmful work practice. That mean, harmful work practice means that there is really no benefit uh, to employers to engage in these types of behaviors. So we must do something to rectify these situations. Now, I'd like to, to think about a term called precarious work. And what is precarious work? really mean? Well, it means that work is uncertain, it's unstable, and it's insecure. And it's one where the employees or the workers have to bear the risk of engaging in the work, and they receive very limited social benefits and statutory protections. There's a, a couple of different dimensions to precarious work. Some have to do with, uh, with the temporal nature of the work and, and the continuity of the employment. Um, some, some have to do with the organizational, uh, uh, like the clarity or the lack of clarity uh, between the employer and the workers and who has control over the working conditions. Um, there's also an economic dimension in terms of, of being poorly paid for the work that's done or not having access to uh, promotions or being able to change some of the, the payment structure. And there's a social di uh, dimension to precarious work and having legal or, or other protections against unfair uh, treatment, discrimination, and unacceptable working practices or unsafe working practices. So precarious work means that um, an employer shifts the risk and the responsibilities of the work onto the workers. And I think we see a lot of uh, instances of precarious work, even here in the US, if we look at some of the industries uh, where a lot of our Latino families uh, are working. If we take, for example, um, agriculture or um, manufacturing or um, construction. These are industries that are dangerous and in fact they have very few protections uh, for workers and there's always the risk of, of, of losing the job or as a contract job and that's not stable over time. We see this over and over again with farm workers and with construction crews. Now, thinking about farm workers and construction crews, uh, I just wanted to give you an example uh, of how this uh, plays out. If we look at some of the national statistics related to uh, these industries and fatal injuries in these industries, we can see that um, in agriculture, forestry, and fishing, that uh, we have the highest rate of work-related fatalities. 
And if we look at construction, we have the highest number of work-related fatalities. Now, again, these are both industries that are dominated by primarily Latino workers. So this is important for us to think about when we think about how do we improve the health and well-being of our community, we've got to think about where people are working and how do we change the work environment to create a more safe and a more healthy environment. So um, there's a number of factors that create vulnerability in the work environment. For example, um, being a foreign born worker, like an immigrant or a refugee, um, being an undocumented worker, being a temporary worker, uh, lacking training or experience to do the job that you may be engaged in, lacking the language proficiency, um, or having low levels of formal education or uh, being in a certain age demographic, which may put you at more risk. For example, if you're an older worker, you may have some physical conditions that limit your ability to hear or to see, which may make the job more risky. We know that workers can have overlapping vulnerabilities. So that means you can simultaneously be a member of, of multiple groups uh, of vulnerable, that are considered vulnerable groups. Um, and so that multiplies the risk and the vulnerability of engaging in that type of work. So as I mentioned early on, I do um, some research with vulnerable workers, primarily in the agri-food system. And as you all know, and have been watching the news and reading in the paper, uh, well, there's a global pandemic and COVID-19 has created a, a huge problem uh, in our society uh, across the globe. Uh, over 4.6 million people have uh, contracted the disease and, and uh, over 300,000 people uh, all around the world have died from COVID-19. So this is a global pandemic, a very serious uh, global health issue, public health issue. It's also a very serious local concern. Here in Nebraska, we've had over 10,000 positive COVID-19 cases, and we've had over 120 people who have died so far um, from the virus. Um, COVID-19 is not just uh, a health issue, but it's creating a lot of other uh, issues across our society. Some of those have to do uh, with the economic situation that we find ourselves in uh, and the social situation uh, that it has created. So let me uh, talk a little bit more about the agri-food system and how COVID-19 is affecting our agricultural producers. Uh, right now, there are huge, huge losses uh, in livestock markets all across uh, the U.S. We're seeing that many agricultural producers, farmers, ranchers, uh, feedlot workers um, are having to seriously reconsider their business um, and having to manage their livestock capacity uh, because there is decreased uh, processing capacity for uh, animals and for their, their byproducts. So what does that mean? That means that um, producers are having, like dairy producers are having to dump uh, excess milk because it can't get processed. Means that people uh, are having to destroy uh, eggs if they're, if they're um, producing eggs. Um, some producers are having to euthanize their livestock uh, because they can't process it quickly enough uh, through the plants. Like for example, uh, there's a lot of concerns in the pork market right now um, because of the closure of some of the pork processing plants that yeah, the producers can't get their animals uh, in quick enough and so they're having to euthanize them. Um, and in terms of the, the cattle, we're seeing that uh, cattle are a little bit easier uh, to manage because cattle can move from the feedlot, uh, which is a huge industry here in Nebraska, they can move them back from the feedlot back onto pasture so they can manage the, uh, they've given themselves a little bit more time uh, in the cattle market, but this is still having huge uh, consequences uh, on uh, on agricultural producers and those who work for agricultural producers. It's creating a lot of stress, a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, economic pressures, and of course there's health concerns uh, related uh, to COVID-19 that people are having to deal with as well. 
So uh, at UNMC, we have, uh, and through our Central State Center for Agricultural Safety and Health, we are very concerned with uh, how agricultural producers are, are dealing with COVID-19 and trying to support them uh, during this time. Um, I lead a project related to Latino immigrant cattle feedlot workers in our, in our region, primarily in Nebraska and Kansas, uh, because we are the, the number two and number three states for cattle on feed, uh, which means we have a lot of cattle in our region and a lot of people who are working with the cattle. We've created some infographics, bilingual infographics, which discuss uh, some of the measures that cattle feedlot workers can take to protect themselves from COVID-19 on the job. Um, we want to get that information out to them and one of the ways that we're doing that is through social media and promoting uh, the posts through Facebook. We've had some really great success and had uh, about 30,000 people who have viewed uh, these infographics. So we feel really happy that we're able to share this type of information. We've also created another infographic related to managing stress and anxiety uh, for agricultural producers and feedlot workers in English and Spanish, again, also promoted through social media. But these give uh, steps about um, making sure that you're, you're um, getting credible information, that you're controlling the amount of information that you get so that you're not overwhelming yourself, and taking care of your physical body. So again, tying in that idea that health is more than just the physical body, but it's also uh, the mental, the mind, and our social well-being. At UNMC, uh, you might have heard that we are also very concerned about meat packing plant workers and, and meat processing facility workers. Uh, we know that, uh, that these folks are considered critical workers. They're in an in essential industry um, and they're experiencing a lot of health disparities associated with COVID-19. If we look at Douglas County, uh, just as an example, uh, 40, almost 46% of all of the positive COVID-19 cases in our county uh, are uh, within the Latino Hispanic community. And some of these have to do with meatpacking plants. Um, obviously, um, over a thousand of the cases in Douglas County right now are associated with the plants. Our team at UNMC has been, we've got a couple of different things going on to try to protect uh, meatpacking plant workers. One is that we've got a, a team that is actually conducting site visits of many of the meat processing facilities all across our state. And they have created, we have created a playbook which provides uh, the best practices and our recommendations that based on uh, what we know related to controlling the spread of infectious diseases. Uh, and in this playbook, we talk about what are some of the engineering controls that plants may uh, take. Uh, for example, creating barri physical barriers between workstations uh, for workers on the line, or changing the way that um, hallways are work in the plant so that they're only moving in one direction instead of having people crossing paths face to face. We also provide some recommendations around administrative controls and policies that employers may consider to try to, to protect their work their workers. Um, for example, um, making sure that all workers have access to paid sick leave. Uh, so if they were to come down um, positive with COVID-19 that they could actually take the time to be home and away from the work environment um, and so that they can get well before they come back. We know that oftentimes these jobs are, are not that well paid and people are living paycheck to paycheck. And so if they don't have paid sick leave, people are going to be coming to the workplace sick because they have a necessity. They have to work because they have to support their families. So giving paid sick leave is a, is a really strong recommendation that we make in this book um, so that we can make sure that um, people are not spreading the virus because they don't have, they can't stay home. We also um, uh, tell employers to have a universal mask policy. So to ensure that all workers have access to a face mask and that it should be mandatory at work at all times. 
And finally, we give recommendations around personal protective e equipment, um, such as using the face mask um, and, and other types of personal protective equipment that may be necessary in the workplace. All of these guidelines, this playbook that we've created is available online for anybody to see. So if you're interested, I'd encourage you to um, go and visit our website and you can see uh, the document for yourself. Be feel free to share that information with people who you, who you may know who are working in the meat processing or meat packing industries. Um, one of the things that we're trying to do is to, to take that from uh, the playbook, which is much more geared for a management or, or a leadership audience and take out key recommendations and, and, and educate workers about those key recommendations. And we've actually created a flyer that's available in English, Spanish, and French, which gives the, the, the highlights of the recommendations for workers and the things that they have control over. Um, so it gives recommendations on what you can do at work, like for example, uh, wearing the mask and how, what you need to do to to take care of that mask so that you keep it clean and you're able to use it without uh, getting any of the virus uh, into the mask or getting the mask dirty. Uh, we also provide some recommendations about what you can do outside of work. So for example, uh, limiting carpooling or limiting uh, visiting of friends and family and give uh, some suggestions on, on what to do if you or a family member is sick and how to care for them uh, in the home. So those are some of the community education pieces that we are creating right now for workers. We know that our site visit team uh, is getting a, a limited perspective when they go into the plants. They're getting the view that management and leadership wants them to see. Uh, and so one of the things that we're doing is a worker survey, which is currently open. Uh, we're trying to hear more from the workers from uh, the ground level of what's really going on in the plants. And so we've created the uh, survey, which is available online. Workers can take the survey in English, Spanish, or French. Uh, it does not require a name. It does not require that you give the plant's name. Uh, all of the questions are voluntary, so you could choose to answer any of the questions that you'd like and skip the ones that may make you feel uncomfortable. But the idea here is to get better information about what, what's happening in the plants and what workers need, uh, what types of information do they need to try to protect themselves and to be able to protect their families. So again, thinking of both work and non-work related situations and what we can do to help. Uh, this is one of the ways that at UNMC, we're really trying to um, to take care of, of those who are taking care of us. So we'd love for you uh, to share the information that we have available uh, for meat processing facilities, for meat packing workers, and encourage anybody that you know who's working in the industry to please take our survey. It will be open until uh, the, the 22nd of May. Um, so uh, if you know anybody, encourage them to take it. Uh, you can see the links for the survey uh, here on the screen. And then I'd, I'd love to um, be able to talk more with you uh, if you have any more questions or concerns about what we are doing related to COVID-19. Um, the work that I've, I've referenced today um, with cattle feedlots and in the meatpacking industry is really a team effort. Uh, and that's really the way that we work. We're a very interdisciplinary team. We know that everybody comes with their own unique strengths uh, and we try to maximize the strengths that are on our team. So I'd like to thank all of my team members for all of uh, the time and the effort and the dedication that they put into our projects because without all of us working together, it's difficult to solve the problems. And, and I think that's true for all of us in the community too. If we don't work together, it will be difficult uh, to solve these problems. Um, um, and COVID-19 is, is just the most recent example uh, of something that we need to work together on because it really is more than just a work issue. It's not just a plant issue. It's not just a community issue. This is a work and community issue and we must work together to resolve it.
Um, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, thank you for listening. And again, please feel free to reach out to me if there's uh, any questions that you may have or you're interested in more in the research that we're doing related to protecting workers in the agri-food system. Have a great day. Bye-bye.